Good morning, my name is Mohamed Abdelouf. This is our second video this morning. And the topic today is interesting changes to the Maintenance Act, changes you may not know of. So we all know that the Maintenance Act is there to assist parents or individuals in obtaining, you know, fair and adequate support from the next individual. Um, the Maintenance Act doesn't only apply to kids, if you are a spouse, you can also use a Maintenance Act. You can even use a Maintenance Act to claim maintenance from your children. So if you are a senior citizen and you cannot care for yourself, you can go to the Maintenance Court and apply for maintenance via the maintenance process against your children. So that's also possible. So interesting changes to the maintenance act changes you may not know of welcome to this webinar um, if this is the first time you are joining us you are welcome and if you find this video useful or someone that might be able to use it please share it we would like um, as much people as possible to benefit from these type of videos so in short the maintenance act is there to assist people in obtaining fee and adequate maintenance. So what does the maintenance get used for? Obviously for the simple things like accommodation, food, clothing, education, and so on. So how do you apply for maintenance? In short, before we touch on the topic, you go to the maintenance court, you fill in an application form, they call in the other party, they look at both parties' income and expenditure, and then they make a decision. That's a simple answer to it. Obviously, it's a bit more intricate. They will obviously have to determine whether or not the other party can afford to pay the child maintenance or the maintenance for yourself or whoever the person is. And obviously, um, whether or not there is a justifiable reason for the specific amount claimed. So for argument's sake, if the other party only earns a small amount of money and you want a great amount of money and you do not really need that amount of money, the court will have to determine whether or not that is justifiable or not. So we get a lot of queries as to people asking us what will happen at the maintenance court? Will the maintenance court order me to pay a much greater amount than I can actually afford? No, the court won't do that. If you cannot afford to pay the child maintenance, the court won't order you to do that. But if you are unemployed, but you have assets, you know, you have cars, properties, etc., but you are unemployed, um, the court will obviously consider that as being something that can be used to pay the maintenance to the other party. We're not, we're not going into the, into the factors to be considered specifically as to how to calculate child maintenance that we leave for webinar for another day and there's various articles on our website dealing with that so the topic today is let's get back to it interesting changes to the maintenance act changes you may not know of so for me firstly the most interesting change that came about in terms of the maintenance amendment act of 2015 is if there was a verbal or written maintenance agreement which was not made an order of court. So it's a, a written agreement between you and the other party. The maintenance court can be approached to substitute or discharge it. So you have a written agreement in place. You are abiding to that specific written agreement. But now you feel, you know, I do not want to pay any more in terms of that written agreement because I can't afford, cannot afford it. You are welcome to go to the maintenance court and have it discharged. Or if you want a bit of a higher amount to pay, you're welcome to go to the maintenance court based upon that specific agreement and have it substituted with a different agreement. So that's something very really interesting to look at. The second significant change is you may lodge a complaint at the maintenance court within the area of jurisdiction of where you reside, carry on business, or are employed. That's a very uh, fundamental change because in terms of the previous um, laws in place, you could only apply for child maintenance or for maintenance at the court where you resided, where you lived. So you might live, for example, in the suburbs, but you work in the city center. Um, previously, you should have gone back home or stayed at home and go to the maintenance court in your area um, and then later on go to work in the CBD. Um, with this amendments, you can now go to work, tell the boss or ask the boss, can I take an hour to off to approach a maintenance court to make an application? Um, you go to the maintenance court in your area where you reside and you make application and come back to work. So that's a very interesting amendment to the Maintenance Act. 
The next interesting change is that the maintenance court may issue a direction directing one or more electronic communication service providers to furnish the court with the contact information of the person a complaint has been made against to obtain his or her whereabouts. For example, Vodacom, MTN, Celsi, Virgin Mobile, and so on. So what does that mean? So if you cannot obtain the you know, contact details of the party who is supposed to pay maintenance, um, you, the court can approach Vodacom because the person has a cell phone number and is connected to Vodacom and all know this Rika and all these things that you have to do if you want to obtain a SIM card, proof of address and your, um, your ID. Um, that SIM card will obviously be recent or be connected to that specific person. Um, they contact Vodacom or MTN and, and ask them, you know, this specific person has a specific cell phone number, please provide us with the most recent information regarding the specific person. I uh, would imagine also they can go one step further and maybe obtain some more further personal information as to where um, that person was last located based upon cell phone records, towers, etc. Uh, but I speak off the cuff the way that is concerned. The next point, point number four, the maintenance court can make an interim maintenance order even if the other party does not agree to it. And that's something really interesting because in the past, when I used to approach the maintenance court for interim orders, if the other party did not agree upon an interim order, uh, into the maintenance order, um, there's nothing we could have really have done. We had to wait till the end of this whole procedure, which can take many, many months. Obviously, at the end of those many, many months, the court can make an order that you know, maintenance that was not paid from the word go should be paid. But that is, it becomes complicated because you're approaching the maintenance court for maintenance. So why must you wait many, many months if there is clearly a case that the other party can afford to pay and um, there is an amount that the child requires. So that is a, a very positive uh, amendment to the Maintenance Act. So you go to the maintenance court, you say the other party has not paid any child maintenance, he or she says, no, I have been paying, I've been paying a thousand rand per month. The court will say, okay, to stop this whole dispute from happening, I'm making an order that you should continue paying one thousand rand per month until this matter is finalized. Obviously, the maintenance amount will vary from person to person. For one party, a maintenance amount of a thousand rand per month would be reasonable, adequate, and affordable. For another party, it might be too much, and for another party, it will be too little. So the next point, point number five, the maintenance court can provide your details to credit bureaus if you are in default of civil execution of a maintenance order that took place. So, what does that mean? If a person is in default of a maintenance order, you can have the person basically blacklisted at credit bureaus. So that person cannot apply to get a new car, you know, maybe buy a house, um, get a cell phone. It's possible that that blacklisting will limit all those things from happening. So it's a positive thing in my view that a person who does not pay child maintenance or whatever maintenance is in arrears, default of the maintenance order, he or she approaches you know, MTN for a cell phone contract, they will say, no, you cannot pay, you can't, sorry, you cannot obtain a new contract because you are in arrears with your maintenance order and that you have been blacklisted. So obviously he or she must pay the maintenance and then the blacklisting will hopefully be, you know, rescinded, removed. And the last point, non-compliance with maintenance orders could have you imprisonment, imprisoned for up to three years. That's section 31, the amendment made to that section. A very interesting section because previously it was up to one year and now, now it's up to three years. So if you do not pay your maintenance, the other party who must obtain the maintenance approaches the court, lays a criminal complaint, they find you guilty. Um, it might be more than likely they won't most probably imprison you immediately for a period of three years. But the court has the option of imprisoning you for three years. Obviously, each case is different. If you really could not have afforded to pay the child maintenance, that's one issue. But if you could have afforded to pay the child maintenance, but you blatantly refuse to pay the child maintenance, whatever the maintenance is, um, it makes it more serious. And obviously, you have to be punished for that. Um, how will you learn your lesson? Because next time you do it again. My experiences with the maintenance courts are that, you know, if you are in arrears and you pay it, pay it up, um, they basically, you know, withdraw the criminal charge, but it depends on the court and it depends on the circumstances of each case. So to summarize, not to mention all the facts again, there are serious amendments to the main